Good morning and welcome to CEDAR's Victorian State Budget Briefing. I'm CEDAR's Chief Economist, Jared Ball, and I'm pleased to be with you today as we hear from Victorian Treasurer, Tim Pallas. CEDAR acknowledges that today and every day we are on Aboriginal land. We're committed to recognition and reconciliation. We respect elders and we support their stated aspirations. In his budget speech yesterday, the Treasurer reaffirmed the Victorian government's commitment to the work of recognising our First Peoples Assembly and to a fairer future for Aboriginal Victorians. So just 24 hours after the budget was handed down, we really appreciate the Treasurer taking the time to address the business community on the government's priorities to drive uh, recovery in the state. I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors for today's live stream, CEDAR National Members McConnell Dow and also Westpac. Um, McConnell Dow has been a CEDAR member for 10 years and Westpac is actually a CEDAR Foundation member, uh, been there right from the start since 1960 when we were founded. Uh, your ongoing and active support is incredibly important uh, to the platform that we provide for uh, policy, political and economic debate. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Westpac's Global Head of Public Sector, Jason Kombolski, uh, as the facilitator for today's discussion with the Victorian Treasurer. Over to you, Jason. Thank you for that. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, the Honourable Tim Pallas, Treasurer of Victoria, fellow CEDA trustees, my colleagues from the Westpac Group, participants from today's co-sponsor, McConnell Dow, and all the supporters of CEDA that have connected into this live stream event on this very bright and sunny uh, late spring uh, day here in Melbourne. A very warm welcome to you and greetings to you all. Uh, as Jared mentioned, my name is Jason Kambowski and I'm Westpac's Global Head of Public, Public Sector, responsible for the bank's engagement with its government clients, primarily across Australia and New Zealand, but also covering our sovereign and supranational clients across the globe. Now, before I run through today's agenda, including introducing our guest speaker, can I take the opportunity to also to acknowledge that we hold this live stream event on the traditional lands of Australia's First Nations peoples. For me, based here in the inner northwest of Melbourne, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge their song lines, their cultural law, their connection to land and water. I also acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging, and I thank them for their sharing of knowledge and of cultural law. And can I also extend my respects to any other First Nations people who are viewing today's event. Now, it's an absolute honour to be moderating today's seat of Victorian State Budget Briefing. Um, the fact that uh, Westpac has partnered with CEDA across a number of key events during this year, including I think most of the State of the State series across Australia. And I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to be involved in this event, particularly during this uh, challenging time, and also the fact that I do live in Melbourne as well. Today represents a great opportunity to hear from the state, to hear about the state's financial position and the government's policy priorities for the year ahead as we support the rebuilding of a stronger Victoria. From none other than the Honourable Tim Pallas, who is Treasurer of the state, is really at the forefront of shaping the state's future. I think it's an absolute underestimation or understatement to say that we have and we continue to live in unprecedented times. There's no one in Australia who has been untouched by the pandemic. It's had a devastating impact on the Australian people in many varied and different ways, and also the Australian economy. And no, no doubt it'll take us a while to recover. You know, the Victorian economy has certainly not been immune, and one could probably rightly argue that it's, you know, may in fact be the most severely affected in all of Australia due to the second wave lockdown, but also the nature of the Victorian economy with its exposure to international students, tourism, and major events. However, as we approach the end of November with 26 consecutive days of zero community transmission, zero deaths, and now zero active cases in the state, it's a much more positive position. And there are some really bright spots emerging across the Victorian economy. The Westpac card tracker, which is based on millions of credit and debit card transactions processed by the Westpac Bank, indicates that spending in Victoria has indeed bounced back and continues to bounce back, and in many cases is approaching pre-COVID levels. In the most recent card tracker report, uh, Westpac card tracker report uh, with respect to Victoria, there's really been a record stunning 21.5 point jump in the first week of November. Now that's the single biggest weekly gain recorded by a state during the whole year. 
Labor, mar labor market trends also confirm that the state's reopening with activity expanding during October with hours worked increasing by 5.6% for the month. Uh, whilst we're overall, we're 9% down because, uh, because of the COVID situation um, compared to pre-COVID levels, that latest increase arrests about a third of the decline, which is incredibly positive. Consumer sentiment, as measured by the Westpac Melbourne Institute Consumer Sentiment Survey, shows Victorian consumer sentiment lifted by 42% over the three-month period, August through to November, um, compared to the national um, positive improvement of 35%, and, that, and that's a record movement in the survey's 45-year history. Melbourne house prices are up by 0.05% in November, which will hopefully be reflective of a springing back to life of the housing market as well. So these are really good signs, although I'd hesitate to say we're probably not out of the woods yet, and I would expect that the Treasurer will have more to say about the road to recovery in his presentation. At the Westpac Group, we're really keen to build on our long-term engagement across Victoria, which has been for almost 150 years now. Uh, Westpac's widely represented across Victoria, offering financial services, commercial, wholesale banking, supporting customers across diverse industries such as agribusiness, property development, infrastructure, retail, tourism, and the public sector, to name a few. We really do see our central role in supporting the government in helping to integrate new digital technologies for faster, better, and more innovative ways of working. And if there's one thing that that's shown us, it's that the pandemic has highlighted the ability to progress these areas. Since the pandemic began, and particularly during the lockdown, I know I and my team have really worked incredibly closely with departments and agencies in ensuring that funding support was, di was dispersed uh, as efficiently and effectively as possible to those that required it most. In addition to supporting an agile and remote public sector workforce, uh, as they continued to deliver services to the citizens of Victoria. If there's one thing that uh, the pandemic has shown, it's the power of digital and the value of data has never been more evident and the opportunities it represents to deliver improved outcomes for Victoria. And I'm really pleased that we at Westpac have had the privilege to work and support the Victorian government during what has been a very challenging and interesting time. Now, whilst today's event is a virtual one, can I remind everyone uh, on the live stream event that you can still interact with our guest speaker today through the Q&A portal at Pigeonhole. You can do that directly via the live stream page or you can log in via cedar.pigeonhole at at, that's cedar.pigeonhole at, uh, sorry, cedar.pigeonhole.at um, and use the passcode, passcode state of Vic. That's state of Vic as the past code. And you can enter your questions there. In addition to the ability to ask questions of our guest speaker today, you can also rank questions that other people have asked. So please, if you see something that's of interest to you and someone else has asked it, rank it so that I can ensure, so you can ensure that I ask the key questions that people are interested in. In addition, there'll also be a poll question today. Now, a poll question allows you to rank a number of possible responses to a question uh, with respect to what you think is the most important answer or approach. And our poll question for today is, what should be the priorities for Victoria's economic recovery? So the priorities for the economic recovery of Victoria. There's four options for you to choose from. And can I ask that you go in and rank them uh, in terms of importance from one through to four. And at the end of our discussion today, I'll share the outcome of that poll question with those on the session. Can I also encourage you to follow CEDA on Twitter at, at CEDA underscore news. And you can join the conversation today with the hashtag, hashtag state of Vic. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker for today, the Victorian Treasurer. The Honourable Tim Pallas has served the State of Victoria as a member of the Legislative Assembly since 2006, representing the electorate of Tarnit until 2014, and then the electorate of Werribee thereafter. He was a Minister for Roads and Ports and Minister for Major Projects in the Brumby uh, Government until 2010, and then has served as the Treasurer of Victoria in the Andrews Ministry since December 2014. In addition to being the treasurer, he's also the Minister for Economic Development and Minister for Industrial Relations. So a very busy man. I would like now to hand over to our keynote speaker for today, Treasurer Tim Pallas. And I think you're on mute there, Treasurer.
uh, there we go. I think that's I think that's fixed the problem. I, 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 over to you, Treasure. We'd hate to have you on mute. Mute. Yes, uh, and my apologies. Um, uh, anything that's vaguely uh, technical can be uh, challenging for me. So I hope I haven't wasted too much of your time. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, albeit virtually, and to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I also want to thank uh, CEDA for organising today's event. It really is a testament to the high regard that uh, government has for CEDA that this is uh, the first of my many budget events. Uh, so um, uh, you've got the opportunity, the first uh, intervener in, in this space, and we get the opportunity, I think, to ask the first questions uh, directly from business and the community to uh, government about the nature of this uh, budget. CEDA's been working uh, uh, with and for its members throughout this difficult year, and I want to thank uh, Melinda and her team for their work. I'd also, of course, like to thank you, Jason, uh, Jason Kambowski, for hosting today. As you all know, 2020 has been a year like uh, no other that we've experienced. Uh, I've, it's asked more of us than we could have ever imagined. Uh, tested us in ways that we never thought it could. Um, there's no doubt that these times are uncertain, but I think we're presented with a rare opportunity here an opportunity to create a Victoria where regardless of age or gender or background, every Victorian can achieve their potential and feel positive about their future. Um, the circumstances that present themselves in economic terms really do demand a budget to repair, recover and make us stronger than before. And to do that, we need to get more Victorians back into work. We need to ensure that all Victorians can get a job, uh, delivering certainty and security for them and their family. We need to look after families, making sure that they can have confidence in their future and the future of their kids. We have to take care of the people we love most and ensure that if the worst were to happen, we know they'll have the care that they need. That's how we'll build a strong recovery and an even stronger future for our state. We ended this unprecedented year with strong foundations, thanks uh, to our record of responsible economic and financial management. Um, since 2014, economic and employment growth has been strong, both ad averaging around about 3.3% a year over the five years to 2018-19. Uh, over 520,000 more Victorians were employed than when this government was elected. Prudent fiscal management has seen the government deliver operating surpluses that have averaged $2.2 billion each year between 2015-16 to 2018-19. Like so many countries around the world, the global pandemic has resulted in serious impacts to our economy. The unemployment rate is forecast to peak at 8.25% in the December quarter and average 7.75% in 2021. Victoria's economy is forecast to contract by 4% in 2021, following a small decline in 1920. In total, the government uh, had already committed $13 billion before the budget to address the immediate impacts of COVID-19 on the health system, uh, support businesses, and uh, to protect jobs. These impacts would be far worse without the record levels of support provided by government, but it also demonstrates the significant recovery task that lies ahead of us all. Evidence from countries around the world that the best way to protect the economy is to protect people's health and lives. What this chart shows is that the more effectively a country controls a pandemic, the better its economic outcomes. The rapid recovery in business confidence, consumer sentiment and employment that were seen in Victoria uh, since restrictions were eased in October is a demonstration of this. And Jason, I was pleased to hear that your uh, card tracker is uh, once again reaffirming what we're seeing in business and consumer confidence coming through that Victoria is rebounding quite strongly uh, once those social distancing and business restrictions are being lifted. So this budget responds to the scale of the challenge presented by the coronavirus pandemic by investing $48 billion in the things that matter to Victorians. 
We're able to do this as a result of the government's sound financial management over the past six years. We're projecting an operating deficit of $23.3 billion this year, forecast to reduce by almost 75% to $5.9 billion in three years. Net debt is forecast to increase to almost $155 billion by the end of the forward estimates. Record low interest rates mean that the increase in borrowings remain manageable. Interest expenses as a share of total revenue remain uh, eminently manageable. They, they average only 4.4% of revenue per year over the forward estimates. That's just 1% higher uh, than before the onset of the pandemic in 1920. So a modest uh, increase in our debt liabilities, but money put to very good use uh, in a very good cause, the welfare of the Victorian people and getting Victorians back to work. Now, we're not alone in our fiscal approach. In fact, our fiscal approach is broadly comparable to the Commonwealth Government. Uh, in, nine, in 2020, uh, Victoria is forecasting general government operating deficit equivalent to 34.9% of total revenue, uh, less than the uh, Commonwealth equivalent, which is close to 44%. Uh, both Victoria and the Commonwealth will see an increase in debt of around about 20% of our respective economies over the next four years. Uh, but of course, the Commonwealth is leaving us for dead when it comes to debt. They're closing in on $1 trillion worth of debt. At the heart of our economic recovery must be job creation. It's why this budget delivers a targeted set of initiatives that form the jobs plan. It's deliberately ambitious. It'll ensure an extra 200,000 Victorians back in work by 2022 and 400,000 by 2025. In guiding Victoria's recovery, the jobs plan plays to our state strengths, generating growth in new and innovative industries. Supporting our key workers is key to Victoria's successful economic recovery. That's why the, the government is making significant investments to boost workforce participation and to support vulnerable workers. We're investing $1 billion in Victoria's TAFE and training sector and a further $619 million for Jobs for Victoria to extend Jobs Victoria services and to help Victorians into work. We know that the Government uh, alone can't restore the economy. Um, indeed, uh, we're one sixth, one seventh of economic activity in the state. Um, we're a growing uh, element of it, of course, in the current environment. That's why we're supporting businesses to reopen, rehire, and grow. The government has previously announced over six billion dollars in support for businesses, including two point six billion in support to the hardest hit sectors, including hospitality, tourism accommodation, creative industries and retail. More than $2 billion in tax deferrals, more than $1.8 billion in relief from taxes and fees. And this budget builds on this record level of support, providing $836 million in new jobs tax credits for small and medium businesses who rehire staff, restore hours and create new jobs. And this incentive means the, the more that these businesses rehire staff and employ new workers, the less payroll tax that they'll pay. The government will also increase the threshold for paying payroll tax on an annual basis from $40,000 uh, to $100,000. And that'll reduce administration costs and it'll provide some $309 million of cash flow support to some 7,000 businesses. We're also taking some bold steps to address a major issue that's prevented Victorian companies from being able to grow, access to finance. And this budget includes $96 million to establish two venture capital and growth funds to assist businesses that are starting up or expanding. One is focused on boosting our venture capital ecosystem, while the second will be focused on providing loans to new ventures. 50 million for research and uh, development cash flows that will provide some cash flow to small and medium sized businesses, claiming the Commonwealth Government's research and development tax incentive. Now, these 
uh, initiatives. We'll build on the $50 million Victorian Business Growth Fund that we established earlier this year in partnership with the Aware Super, and it's already investing in growing Victorian businesses. Overwhelmingly, what we've seen through this economic event is that women have been most adversely affected. Through the jobs plan, the Andrews Labor government will support more women back into the workforce, ensuring that they have the stability and security that they deserve. We're providing over $500 million to create jobs across mental health, family violence, health, child protection, and education. We're making kinder free next year and we're expanding before and after hours care in 400 schools. $150 million will go towards wage subsidies to support businesses who hire 6,000 women. One third of these subsidies will go to women over the age of 45, recognising the additional barriers that they face. And we'll roll out a range of other initiatives to support women in specific industries, including construction, tech and transport. A key part of our economic recovery is having a strong pipeline of infrastructure projects delivering the jobs and projects our state needs. Earlier this year, we announced a $2.7 billion building works program for shovel ready projects, which is already creating thousands of jobs across Victoria. This budget invests even more. Victoria's big housing build will invest $6 billion, including a record $5.3 billion to build more than 12,000 new social and affordable houses and $678 million to help make uh, housing more accessible and affordable. Over $4 billion will go towards initial and early works on the suburban rail loop and stage one of the Geelong Fast Rail to better connect our state with $1.6 billion towards road network and infrastructure upgrades. As part of our manufacturing revival, $1.5 billion will go towards procuring 100 next generation trans, which will be proudly manufactured here in Victoria. Uh, $1.9 billion will deliver a school building blitz added to the initiatives we already announced early in the year that's close to $3 billion worth of school capital works that are uh, underway as a consequence of this year's allocations. $1.6 billion will be put towards improving energy efficiency in Victorian homes and it'll accelerate clean energy investment while supporting thousands of new Victorian jobs. And $1.4 billion will transform Melbourne's arts precinct, including building the country's largest gallery dedicated to contemporary art and design. With a total of $134 billion of new and existing projects now funded underway, our infrastructure program will support around 165,000 jobs. As we begin to look to the future, our state recovery from this pandemic will rely on supporting the hardest hit industries and playing us to our strengths for the future of the economy. So we're establishing a $2 billion Breakthrough Victoria Fund to drive investment in research, innovation, and the next great breakthroughs over the next 10 years. And it's expected to create a pipeline of 15,700 jobs. And we're making significant investments to support key industry sectors, including higher education, medical research, manufacturing, agriculture, startups, and our creative industries. We know that we need to make our economy more productive to restore growth and jobs. Uncertainty and bottlenecks in project planning approvals risk our ability to unlock new investments and future growth. That's why this budget commits $75 million for a regulatory reform package to enable firms to innovate and reduce the cost of doing business. This includes running a second round of the Better Approvals Program, as well as establishing a regulatory reform incentive fund, an incentivized based regulation unit, and a fast track review unit. $111 million for planning system reforms to support urban and regional development and state infrastructure projects. This pandemic has affected our state deeply. Uh, our recovery 
will rely on supporting every Victorian, every community, every corner of our state. From schools to hospitals, road and rail, we've strengthened our economy by ensuring no community and no Victorian is left behind. It's why we're investing more than $8 billion to support regional economies to get back on track by creating jobs all over Victoria. All up, this government has invested over $26 billion in regional Victoria, more than three times what the previous government delivered for regional Victoria. $4.7 billion will be invested in upgrading our country roads and rail to ensure that regional areas are better connected. $682 million will be spent across our state to deliver cheaper, cleaner energy. $626 million will support broadband connectivity across regional Victoria and in partnership with the Commonwealth, eradicate remaining mobile black spots. And we'll restart the tourism sector, providing $465 million in dedicated support to the sector, including regional travel voucher scheme to encourage more Victorians to take a break in their home state. Uh, we've got a lot more in this budget. In fact, um, sometimes it's a bit like reading off a very long list, but it's necessary. From supporting our child protection system to a huge energy efficiency program and massive investments in our mental health as the interim response to the Royal Commission. We've got a long journey ahead of us, but I'm confident that our jobs plan will build our state as we rebuild our economy. It will support our industries and leverage our strengths. It'll get Victorians back to work. It'll leave no Victorian behind. And just like our government, it will put people first. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you for that, Treasurer, um, for sharing your thoughts and outlining how the latest budget will support Victorian families and businesses and kickstart the economic recovery from what has been a challenging period as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. So thank you for that. Now it's time for audience participation. Now, can I just remind everyone again, if you do have any questions, please go to Pigeonhole. You can put your questions there, you can post them, you can support questions that you want to make sure that I ask. Um, and also importantly, can you vote on the poll question as well? We want as many people as possible um, voting so we make sure that we get to the key answer that, that I can share at the end of this. Now to start today's conversation and discussion, we're gonna take a lead from a very well-known uh, television program that's based around audiences asking questions mostly of elected officials. I think everyone can probably think of the one that I'm talking about. Um, we've actually got a couple of video questions that we're going to put to you, Treasurer. Um, the first of our video questions that we've got is from David Sims, who's the General Manager of Victoria and Tasmania from McConnell Dow. Hi, I'm David Sims. I'm the General Manager for McConnell Dow here in Victoria. The construction industry I think we're on mute with the question. Its capability and capacity. What skills initiatives or funding does the government have in its budget to help open No, I, I think you, you can't hear that, Treasurer. No, I can't, sorry. All right, can we, um, can, can we have one more go maybe at uh, re, re showing that first video question? Otherwise, whilst maybe we're waiting for that to be fixed up, um, we, might, we might go into a couple of questions that have been asked from the audience. So Treasurer, I've got a question here from Anna Maria, and it's, is it possible to provide more detail on the breakthrough for Victoria Fund? So what's the process going to be around funding and when will details be released that people will be able to have access to? Yeah, this will be a fund that will receive uh, a $2 billion uh, direct allocation out of this budget. The aim will be to look at those opportunities that we have to better align research and innovation. Uh, we know that we've got some of the world leading research in this, in this country, uh, and we need to uh, better align uh, our universities, our research and our commercial capacities. So in those areas that we know that we've got an advantage, whether it be med tech uh, or whether it be uh, areas such as agricultural innovation uh, and so many others, a pharmaceutical development, for example. Um, we're looking for those bright ideas that will propel the Victorian economy forward by putting us at the cutting edge of innovation 
and uh, commercialization of that innovation. We've got great commercial, we've got great innovative capacity, great research. Where we've tended to fall down is just being able to take advantage of those skills and aptitudes and see that Victoria reaps the rewards of that great research and gets the commercialization of that as a reward for this state. So that's what this fund is aimed at doing, together with a number of other funds that we're establishing in this budget that will recognise and resort, um, assist entrepreneurship, that will now allow people to deal with cash flow, that the state will take equity in some of these startup ventures in an effort to make sure that we can uh, just maximise every opportunity for greater innovation and commercialisation of our ideas and our skill base, which um, uh, if you look at our universities, we can have a fair degree of justification in knowing that uh, we, we lead the nation in great research. We need to turn that great research and ideas into great commercial opportunities. Thank you for that, Treasurer. Um, you, you, you mentioned during your presentation um, the, the, the approach of the state budget you know, in line with the federal government with respect to spending on infrastructure, also to borrowing funds to ensure that we keep stimulating the economy. Um, what's the role of the state versus the federal government in a situation like we have at the moment? And, and I think about national cabinet um, and you know, the changes that seem to have happened between the federal state relationship as a result of national cabinet. You know, is it a complementary? Uh, how, how would you describe that relationship now between federal and state? Well, you've had me on a, a few of these uh, CEDA talks and on occasion, I will admit that uh, I have um, fallen into um, the, politic, uh, the political rhetoric and the divide between states and Commonwealth. But I've got to say, in a circumstance like this, there's just people don't have any truck for politicians who are trying to play a political game while we're facing an existential threat. Um, and that's exactly how we've attempted to deal with these issues. Uh, there's no place for politics at a time like this. It's all shoulders to the wheel in an effort to try and protect Victorian uh, uh, welfare, uh, preserve Victorian businesses and assure the community that the future can be brighter. And certainly that has been our approach and we're pleased to work in partnership with the Commonwealth Government. Yes, of course, we will from time to time have nuanced differences. Um, of course, you, you've probably seen that the Commonwealth would have liked us uh, to remove our restrictions um, uh, on social distancing and restrictions on how business operated earlier. Uh, but we've taken the view, and the Premier has been resolute in his uh, decision, that the State of Victoria will uh, effectively fight the pandemic first, and it's only then that we get the opportunity to open up our economy. And we're seeing it the world over that those economies that made the, the false assumption that they could live with the presence of the coronavirus in and amongst their communities, they are reaping very substantial economic pain. Now, it's true that because of the second wave, uh, we've had a harder time of it here in Victoria uh, than any other state. But through Victorian sacrifice and hard work, we've been able to come through. Uh, and we will uh, essentially reward that sacrifice and effort by the state uh, now making its contribution to ensure that Victorian businesses and families are well catered for as we grow the economy. And that's what this budget's all about. It's about uh, rewarding that sacrifice and putting people first. Thank you. Thank you for that, Treasurer. Um, I think we've still got a, a challenge with our first video question. So what I might do is I might actually read out um, what, what the first question was. So this was from David Sims, who's General Manager of Victoria and Tasmania at McConnell Dale. Um, and his question was, the construction industry is already stretched in terms of its capability and capacity. What skills, initiatives or funding does the government have in its budget to overcome these issues? Yeah, we're, we acknowledge that there are challenges with the construction industry at the moment, Jason, and um, in no small part, due to the size of the government's ambition for construction. Um, there are skill challenges, there are competition challenges, uh, and in many cases, the solution to this has to be multifaceted. The first thing we have to do is recognise that we can't keep feeding the same cohorts and section of the industry. And that means we need to recognise that there are uh, first-tier uh, constructors, 
second tier, third tier, even fourth, fourth tier constructors uh, who all have to be engaged specifically around what they can deliver. That's why our building works package, which was the initial uh, contribution we made to uh, some counter cyclical economic activity, looked at those smaller capital works that could get underway as quickly as possible and have that greater job multiplier impact. We're investing $19.6 billion each and every year over the next four years in infrastructure, construction and delivery. Now, to put that into some context, that's over four times the amount of construction activity that preceded this government coming to office, so the 10-year average that preceded us coming into office. So it is an enormous task. It's going to require uh, an effort through our TAFEs to train more people, short course provision uh, to ensure that those people who can top up skills and move into those areas of activity, they need to do it. Victoria established uh, the Australian Major Projects Leadership Academy, and we're training public sector uh, project managers to have better skills. We've got engagement with the private sector uh, around how we deal with risk allocation as we go forward in our projects. Um, and of course, uh, we do understand that um, this will mean that we're going to have to find ways of bringing more competition into our marketplace, particularly at the top end of the market. It's too top heavy and there are too, too few um, uh, tier one providers. And we're working with companies that are close to getting to that tier one category. And we're keen to encourage international uh, investment so that we can bring more players into the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you, Treasurer. I, I think we've fixed uh, the little glitch that we had uh, with respect to the video questions. Um, I don't think I'll be taking over hosting Q&A anytime soon. But um, anyway, let's, let's go to the next video question that we had. And this video question is from Felix Rossman, who's the head of Westpac's public sector team in Victoria. Good morning. My name is Felix Rossman and I'm the head of Westpac's Victorian public sector team. My question for the Treasurer is, with the ongoing challenges presented by COVID, could you perhaps comment around the broader reform agenda that the government is considering to help assist economic recovery in the state moving forward? Sure. Um, there's a lot in this budget that um, really does uh, look at how do we change the way that we work and uh, the way that we operate. The, uh, the digital connectedness um, that we're putting in place recognising that there has been a very substantial attraction in the community to uh, more diverse ways of working and working remotely. Um, things that we didn't think that we could do in the past, uh, we're doing as standard fare now, and it's amazing how culturally we've changed so quickly. Uh, we want to be able to capitalise on that change. That's why we're putting over $600 million into uh, this budget to improve digital connectedness. Uh, which will hopefully disperse some of the wealth in the population um, that uh, has tended to concentrate close to um, uh, the CBD of Melbourne, broadly across the state. Um, of course, if you uh, have access uh, to uh, a better digital connected opportunity, the eradication of mobile black spots in partnership with the Commonwealth, uh, high capacity broadband linkages, in partnership again with the Commonwealth and NBN. Um, our hope is that that will give people more options and provide for more efficiency at work. Also, we recognise that our planning system has to improve and we're putting in incentivised processes to encourage the removal of red tape, uh, greater partnering with local government to ensure that approvals are, approved, uh, are made quicker so that we can get uh, land into the marketplace and people into homes as quickly as we possibly can. Um, this together with uh, a recognition that we do have to reform the way that people uh, use our road network. So our electric vehicle charging uh, uh, distance scheme is about recognising we are gonna see a proliferation of electric vehicles uh, as time progresses. And uh, instead of using fuel excise to charge for your uh, kilometres of usage of the road network, at least for electric vehicles, we'll see uh, a sharing of the responsibility for uh, the use of your road and the maintenance costs of our road network by all road users. And that will include electric vehicle users as they become more and more a part and parcel of the uh, use of our road network. Um, 
Tricia, sort of a follow-up question on that with respect to reform and uh, you know, questions come through pigeonhole is why has the government not looked to replace stamp duty to further stimulate economic activity, economic activity and replace it with a broader-based land tax, which is being proposed in another jurisdiction slightly north to here? And, um, and I think in the ACT, they're in the process of having rolled it out for a number of years now. Is now the time to look at that as a reform? Uh, put simply, I don't believe so, uh, Jason. I think the community has been subjected to, uh, in fairness, uh, enormous trauma as a consequence of both the pandemic event and um, the uh, economic event that the government is uh, attempting to deal with. So we've taken the view that the first most important thing is to help this industry uh, repair. And the, the first thing we've done, of course, is to remove 50% uh, of stamp duty charges until the um, 30th of June this year uh, for purchases of property under $1 million if they're uh, new properties and uh, to reduce that stamp duty by 25% uh, for existing properties up until the 30th of June. That should give a shot in the arm uh, to the property market and we can assess uh, uh, the options for uh, where we go into the future based on how the industry is traveling. I also think the community probably deserve the respect that uh, we're going to have discussions of that sort of significance. We need to do it in the consequence of uh, a, a budget other than this one, one where uh, clearly it's about economic repair and um, uh, resetting and redesigning what the future looks like, uh, but certainly making sure that we're putting people's interests first rather than necessarily the state's coffers' interests first. I've got another question here that's come through from, from David Pell. Um, does Victoria now have ring-fenced budgets and commitments for hydrogen projects to meet the climate change commitments of the government? Well, there's a lot in this budget, of course, that goes to clean energy. I think $1.6 billion worth of a variety of, of um, investments and interventions. Um, the government, of course, is continuing our efforts and investment in this space, um, whether it's um, solar homes, whether it's uh, uh, batteries, whether it's uh, household batteries, whether it's uh, the big battery build, uh, or indeed connectivity, which enable uh, access to renewable energy offerings right across uh, regional Victoria. Uh, the government is, of course, continuing its efforts in, in cooperation with uh, Kawasaki, the Japanese government and uh, the um, uh, federal government uh, in uh, our hydrogen efforts. Um, and we'll continue those efforts uh, as part of both uh, blue and green uh, hydrogen uh, initiatives. Um, we recognise that the number one priority for hydrogen, and I think there's increasing evidence to suggest that uh, the world is starting to uh, bet quite significantly upon hydrogen as a source fuel. The number one uh, test for us is not necessarily to prove the adequacy of the, um, uh, of the production methods for hydrogen, uh, but more to get the commercialisation of it right and to get the supply chain economics right so that we can deliver to areas where existing and growing demand uh, can exist. And I think that's going to be one of the big challenges going forward. Thank you for that. Um, we've got another question here. It's an anonymous one, but um, you know, it's Treasurer, congratulations on your significant investment in public transport, um, noting the suburban rail link and the airport rail. Um, this person's interested in investment improvements made to public transport in the northeast of Melbourne. I'm assuming that's where they live. Um, and wanting to know if there's anything specific for that area. And, and, and I notice also too, maybe as a bit of a supplementary, that there is money spent for the regions as well. Perhaps you'd like to highlight some of that also. Well, I think uh, the one thing you'll find in this budget is uh, a very big spending transport budget. Um, the obvious uh, investments that we're putting in place around uh, the uh, uh, partnership that we've got with the federal government, uh, upgrading um, our, uh, uh, our uh, delivery of the Melbourne Airport Rail Link. Uh, of course, that was provided for in previous budgets, but of course, the partnership, the alignment has been finalised in agreement with the Commonwealth. Um, the Geelong uh, Fast Rail, $2 billion 
to facilitate that in partnership with the Commonwealth. And that will uh, assist us by opening up additional track into our Western suburbs for accessibility. Uh, importantly, um, being able to complete that vital missing link, the Northeast link, uh, uh, the biggest road project in this state's history will be a vital part of uh, a uh, circular route around metropolitan Melbourne. Uh, the continuing work that's going on with the Westgate Tunnel, um, a, a vital connection from the western suburbs to the city, which will provide us with uh, a, a second uh, a second access point. Uh, for the western suburbs, uh, there's uh, fantastic work rapidly coming to conclusion in the uh, uh, western suburbs uh, uh, suburban roads upgrade project, about $1.4 billion worth of effort and uh, a lot of construction activity in the road network going on. So I think uh, the, the, the story of infrastructure investment is quite profound, both small and large. Um, now added to that, of course, is the $2.7 billion that we've spent um, in this budget. There's a, a further uh, $4.7 billion worth of investment uh, right across the state some $4.7 billion on regional roads to upgrade their capacity. So the government's continuing commitment to road and rail, about $10 billion all up of transport investment, about 80% um, about of it uh, into public transport. So it's a massive shift in terms of the historic spend that has been going on, uh, much greater on the public transport side of the ledger. And hopefully that demonstrates to people that we're trying to uh, recognise that going forward, we're going to have to have more efficient ways of moving people, particularly in metropolitan Melbourne, around. Treasurer, you, you mentioned around electricity, electric vehicles, um, and we, we do have a question here um, about that. Um, does Victoria risk losing the sustainable transport ways to other states due to the introduction of electronic vehicle tax? Well, I don't think so, uh, Jason. This, this is really about fairness. Um, if you take the, um, uh, the basic proposition, the state is already providing uh, incentive payments uh, to people who drive electric vehicles. We give a $100 registration uh, rebate. We give um, motor vehicle duty rebates for vehicles over the cost of about 68000 We know there's a differential cost. It's about $20,000 between electric vehicle and hybrid vehicles than other vehicles, but we also know that uh, we need to have a sustainable basis under which we fund our road network. Uh, if you look at the average cost to a motorist uh, driving a petrol or a diesel vehicle, you've got about 12.1 uh, 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 kilometres per litre in terms of the cost uh, or the uh, fuel efficiency. You're effectively paying about five cents a kilometre uh, to use our road network in excise, fuel excise taxes. Um, now, not all of that gets back to the states through the Commonwealth, but ultimately um, it's about fairness. If effectively we've got uh, uh, electric vehicles who will, uh, we have no doubt, proliferate across uh, the nation uh, and their numbers in our vehicle fleet will grow profoundly in years to come as their efficiency grows and as their price competitiveness grows, we need to find a way to charge for the use of uh, the asset and the resource that the state's providing so we can continue to maintain it. Now, South Australia has already indicated that they uh, are proceeding with such a charge. New South Wales has given every indication as well publicly that they'll uh, move as well. So I think I'll, I'll hazard to guess that every state will move very quickly to make sure that there is a consistent regime for charging so that the states get some restitution for the cost that we'll have to outlay because of the wear and tear that uh, all vehicles, whether they be um, uh, paying fuel excise or paying a usage charge for access to the road for electric, electric vehicles into the future. And it's really simply about fairness. We might go to our last video question that we've got for today. Um, and this question's by Gotze Kozewski, and he's the state manager of Victoria for Built Environs. Hi, Treasurer. My name's Gochi Kozewski, and I'm representing Built Environs as part of the McConnell Dow Group. My question today is in relation to the recent announcement by the government to spend $5.4 billion over the next four years in a social housing blitz. 
It's a two-part question. The first part is in relation to the split. What is the split between multi-level high-rise apartments, medium-density housing, and single-block residential homes? The second part is in relation to capacity. Is the government confident that the industry has the capacity to roll out this government commitment? Has, it, has there been any consideration given for this initiative to be rolled out in a multi-alliance fashion, which has been so successful with the level crossing removal projects? Thank you. Thanks very much for the question. Yes, there's a, there's a lot to be done in this space. And um, of course, the uh, uh, allocation that we've put, uh, $5.3 billion from memory, but uh, also the over $600 million that we're putting into shared equity schemes is gonna mean that we're gonna make housing more affordable and accessible. And we recognise that public housing in particular has, and social housing uh, have uh, required, do require that we can come up with uh, more stock because people are desperately crying out for it. We think this will create something like 12,000 more housing units. It will be spread across uh, both uh, the, the CBD, uh, our middle suburbs, and of course uh, the outer suburban areas, and about 25% of all the build will be in regional Victoria to make sure that all the needs are being catered for uh, at least as uh, fairly as we possibly can in terms of delivery. The uh, delivery mechanism, uh, government will have more to say about that as we put the final touches to the strategy in terms of uh, its rollout, but it will be largely in consultation with industry to ascertain exactly what their appetite is for its delivery. We'll have a, a new agency that will effectively oversight its delivery. And I, I've got every confidence that um, uh, we'll have uh, an ability to deliver this in a cost efficient, effective way, and we'll be able to get it uh, to the community as quickly as possible. Uh, the one thing that we've learned as a consequence of our engagement with uh, the private sector and the uh, community sector is that there are many great ideas to help leverage uh, greater investment from uh, the other sectors uh, to complement and add to the state's investment. And we're very keen to look to see what we can do in partnership. Treasurer, what's the one thing that keeps you awake at night? And then what's the one thing that gets you springing out of bed in the morning as the great opportunity for this state? Look, I think the, the well, I was asked recently, Jason, what um, did I feel unlucky that I was the treasurer of Victoria at a difficult time like this? And my response was, I actually feel very honoured. Um, yes, it, there are enormous challenges that we have to confront as a state. But um, we also have uh, an amazing opportunity to reset and redesign the way our economy works and the way the future should unfold. We all want a fairer Victoria. We all want a Victoria that's more efficient. Um, and we've got to start building it. We've got to conceive that the future doesn't have to be just a recast of the past, what it was like before the pandemic came here. And that's the thing that uh, uh, keeps me awake at night and it's the thing that makes me spring up out of bed in the morning. That's basically because I can't waste too much time sleeping at the moment. Um, these are the things that are enormous challenges. I was thrilled to be with the Premier recently when we started to talk about how we would start piloting secure work so that we uh, provide adequate protections for casual workers. Um, I'm thrilled to see that uh, we're doing more around um, uh, child, uh, kindergarten and uh, out of hours school care and um, also out of home care. The, the things that uh, societies that define them themselves by their compassion doesn't mean that you're not efficient uh, by making these investments, but we've got to find the, the courage. Uh, and I think the, the courage uh, and aptitude uh, as a government to be able to focus on the needs of economic revitalisation without turning our back on our most exposed and those most in need in the community. So getting that balance right, telling business that we have your back and we will continue to support you through this, through the initiatives such as the payroll tax credit that we've put in place, 
you employ more, uh, we'll assist you with your tax liability to the state through payroll tax. It's all about making sure that we get that balance right. We grow the economy and we're not growing it simply for the sake that growth in itself is uh, innately of value. It's about creating wealth, opportunity and jobs for all Victorians. Thank you for that, Treasurer. Um, what I'd like to do now is actually share the outcome of the poll question. Um, so, as I said, the, the question was, what should be the priorities for the what should be the priority for Victoria's economic recovery? Um, the, there were four options, and we have one statement that is clearly out in front. Almost half of those that voted chose this as their priority, and it was investing in infrastructure to drive employment. Any any reflection on that? Treasurer? Yeah, well, we're uh, investing in infrastructure to drive employment like no other government before us and like no other government around the country. Um, this is uh, a big bill that the uh, state has never seen before. As I indicated in my opening remarks, Jason, um, the 10 year average expenditure on infrastructure before we came to government was $4.9 billion. Um, it is now on average, each and every year over this budgeted year and the next three, uh, we're planning on spending $19.6 billion. We've got $134 billion of projects either underway or commencing. Uh, put another way, um, the entire GSP of South Australia and the Northern Territory combined. That's how big this effort is. So no government before us um, ha has ever been this ambitious. And I know that people say, well, uh, are we looking at an intergenerational debt event? I'd make the observation, we're investing now to build the infrastructure for the future, for the next generation, the suburban rail loop, the Melbourne Airport Rail Link. Um, I, I'm fond of using a saying from uh, uh, part of my Greek heritage, I'm only slightly Greek, uh, but um, you know, um, society functions best uh, when uh, old people plant the seeds of trees, the shade of which they know they will never rest beneath. And that's what a good society does. It cares about the future beyond its own horizon because intergenerational um, opportunity, whether we're investing in skills, giving our young people the best opportunities we can, but making sure that they have the architecture of a state, whether it's building better schools or hospitals or transport systems, that's our obligation. Now, our job uh, during the first part of this pandemic was to deal with the pandemic and the threat that it posed to public health. Our next job is to build the future and build it together with all Victorians. Their sacrifice demands nothing less. Treasurer, that's probably a perfect note to end today's discussion on. Um, can I thank you on behalf of everyone on the live stream event today, on behalf of CEDA, Westpac, McConnell Dow, um, as sponsors as well, can we really thank you for your contribution to today's event? We're absolutely privileged that this is the first forum that you've chosen to talk to the budget after delivering it yesterday. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for sharing your insights about the vision of rebuilding a stronger Victoria. We know it's been a very difficult and challenging period to deliver a budget, um, a process that would normally have been done in May, um, but here we sit at the end of November and one that's been done through the support and uh, through all of the, the public service working remotely as well. So we absolutely appreciate the challenges and also keeping the state moving in the intervening period. Um, we really appreciate your frankness, your honesty, and setting out what the future of this great state can look like. Um, can I also once again thank the live stream sponsors, uh, McConnell Dow and the Westpac Group. Without their ongoing support, CEDA wouldn't be able to live. Uh, sorry, wouldn't be able to deliver key and important events like today. Um, finally, again, can I thank the audience for your time and participation in the discussion today. You'll shortly receive a post-event email, which will provide you with a link to a recording of today's live stream event. Alternatively, you can go to the CEDA website and re-watch the event or pass it on to colleagues in your network.
Please also continue the ongoing conversation by connecting with CEDA via LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. There are many ways you can engage and talk to CEDA, or you can uh, go to their website at cedar.com.au. Don't forget that there are some more CEDA live stream events coming up. Um, the next one is the Public Interest Technology Two-Day Forum on the 30th of November and the 1st of December, and then also Optimising Australia's Rail System for the Future on the 14th of December. Don't forget to go and register for those. And finally, can I wish everyone a very productive, but most importantly, a safe rest of the day and week. Thank you very much for tuning in. And Treasurer, thank you once again for sharing with us. We appreciate it. And Thanks, goodbye guys. to everyone.